I'm telling some of the boys the other day, like I've had some of the most philosophical Jordan Peterson-ish conversations around a table full of the most savage dudes on planet Earth. I mean, the shit they are talking about would break the internet. No one has ever had that conversation, I promise you. And you're sitting there and you try not to get starstruck, but like, this is my whole life wrapped up into this room and everything that just came out of your mouth, like, if it wasn't for my ego, I'd cry at this table right now. Like, I have never felt more connected to a group of grown men than I do in this room right now. Oh my God. And it's like, yeah, I mean, like, you're just surrounded by your heroes. Like, holy shit, dude. What is up, Rob Podcast? We have a very special edition today that I'm excited for. I have a lot of FOMO, honestly, that I'm on my phone right now that I'm not up in Virginia, but the guys are up there. Calvin's been spearheading this fun little project. So, first of all, welcome, DJ and Cole, Mr. Creators of the GBRS Foundation. It's a, a privilege to be doing this with you guys. And like I said, I truly wish I was there. If I wasn't forward with it, I wouldn't be, I would be. And I told Calvin I want to plan a trip to come up there when I'm off season and kind of run through the courses with you guys and do some of that cool shit because I'm missing out right now. I'd mean, love to have you up here anytime. Yeah, appreciate the time. It's humbling. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I mean, just for some of our audience, and I know myself, at least, especially in the fitness community, there's a lot of military guys, and we get a lot of support and love from them, and super grateful for that, and we're really excited to be doing this, but for some of the people who may not know, could you guys give us, like, a background on GBRS and what you guys are and what you guys do? You said you only to GBRS? Yeah, so me and Cole, I, I speak for both of us because we have kind of mirror images. We both grew up in Virginia. His uncle was actually a SEAL. My dad was a SEAL. So we were in and around it kind of our whole lives. And I joined the Navy at 17 um, in 2002. And shortly after the towers fell, he joined in 2003, 19. And we both kind of linked up in San Diego going through training. So training to become a SEAL, it's a six month process. And then all the follow on training about a two year pipeline. And we've been stuck at the hip ever since 2003 until 2020 when he retired, basically day in, day out, always together. We showed up at SEAL Team 10 in 2004. We did three deployments there, and then we selected uh, to go to a special mission unit. It's a tier one unit for the Navy. And then we got split into two different squadrons, but we're still best friends. We live next door to each other, best man, a couple times, <laughs> you know, on the whole thing. And then, uh, yeah. you know, combat and training, everything kind of just caught up and really got kind of hurt the last couple of years. We got forced retirement, so I got medically retired at right at 17 years, and so did Cole. For me, it was August of 19. You were May yeah, of 20. 20. Yeah. And then right after that, man, you know, Cole was doing a successful transition in the real estate, was fucking killing it. And I was in the worst depression you could possibly imagine, and I was just cycling, just circling the fucking drain, and really had no way out. And right before then, I had another really bad injury, got electrocuted and kind of blew up my whole upper body. So the contracting and everything I thought I was going to be able to do, I couldn't do. Finally worked back, started rebuilding the whole thing, and I was going to contract and go overseas. And a bunch of our buddies had been getting killed and shot up. And he looked at me one day and he's like, what's it going to take for you not to do that? I was like, well, I don't know, dude. He said, well, why don't we just do a training company together? So we came up with this genius plan of about five minutes and he filed for an LLC and fucking COVID hit. So all the knowledge, all the experience we have, we're trying to give back. We can't give it to anybody. Like now we're stuck. Basically quit our day jobs. Now we're in here and we we're on lockdown, man. We couldn't do anything. But what are we going to do now? We had a bunch of really good mentors that taught us on how to build brands and sell soft goods and kind of locked ourselves in a room. And all the gear that had plagued us for the last, you know, 17 to 20 years, shitty tactical nylon, bad slings, just, you know, outdated designs, we sat in a room and we just redesigned it all and developed a hard good line around it. And it really just took off, man. And we just started hiring all of our friends and all of our, you know, unfortunately, a bunch of Gold Star families, you know, their fathers had gotten killed that we had worked with and we had looked up to over the years and we had the ability to hire them too. And the team has grown. We just hit our four year anniversary and we're at 35 employees now and got a huge product line and yeah, we focus on training. We've got a fitness program, Patreon subscription, and really just the hard goods and soft goods, just constantly trying to develop products for the end user because we understand the pressure they're on 
and a lot of it, the gear they wear is a limiting factor. Very restricted. It's not specifically designed for them or the, you know, the optimal end state. It's kind of just a one size flits all, just this blanketed approach. And that's not the way it is in reality. So if we can help them get literally just 1% out of that, that 1% could be the defining moment. Like that could be the one thing that saves their whole life. And you know, a lot of it now that that's really just what it is trying to connect people to their process and make them a little bit better at everything they do. Yeah. Last four years have been a whirlwind, man. It's been awesome to see. Yeah, no, I can imagine. I mean, you guys starting in COVID is just a testament of like your whole career. You learn how to pivot, you know, it's just going to be thrown at you. It's never, here's the plan. Go do this. Some shit's always going to go off the rocker. You just know how to pivot. So, I mean, I'm not surprised you guys crushed it and probably the hardest time to do it because if anyone knows how to do that shit it's you guys so that's kind of badass but uh you guys mentioned to the the gold star families that's is that 100 percent of your employees you bring on they're all like uh families from lost fathers or and everything so it's not 100 percent. it when we first started it was over 50 percent. i mean really? i get them in here yeah uh, three different families my wife's a gold star wife she works in here too and a lot of them you know one of the ones that works in here, she had four kids. We had three of them in here working. So it's like, you know, it's, it's really like a family affair. And at the end of the day, man, like, you know, life insurance, it doesn't fill the void. Like they're still lacking the same kind of community that you are when you leave it. But it's like when you can bring them all together, you know, group therapy only goes so far, but they all understand the struggles individually they're going through. They understand what it's like to raise kids solo. You know, for yeah. 20 years, most of them don't get remarried like i understand how to speak to to team guy wise and so does cole because we have like i know exactly what's going to make you click i know exactly how to speak to you and you know navigate some of the human terrain we call it because it's, you know they've been through a lot of fucking trauma dude the kids too and you know it's hard to you don't want to shelter them but you definitely you got to be mindful like they've been through some really traumatic shit since they were tiny man like some of these kids yeah. since they were three and four years old so it's cool not to see in their 20s and just thriving. For sure, yeah. No, I think it's, like, amazing how much you guys focus on, like, mental health, and talking, communicating, and pushing that out there. Because, like, in your field, I can only imagine. And the rest of the world is kind of going through that shit, too. And, like, Cole being able to pull him out of, like, trying to go back overseas. Guys becoming a real estate agent from a tier one operator is pretty crazy. But, uh, like... I'm curious because I just talked to my brother-in-law and it's very separate, but bodybuilding is very all-encompassing of your life, not still compared to like going overseas and military and everything, but it's day-to-day, -day, it's everything you do. And so my brother-in-law just retired from being a full-time bodybuilder and probably the most like constantly regimented, like Christmas day, weighing out his meals, not eating cookies, like 365 all day. What was it like? I mean, Cole, you seem to have gotten that before DJ. What was it like for you kind of trying to like transition? How did you do it well? And what led to you being the one that was able to help DJ kind of move into this next stage? I think kind of what led into us starting companies and all that was like DJ touched on the mentors that we had. Um, I've had a bunch of really good ones and they would always push us to think outside the box, um, be comfortable and comfortable and trust in ourselves and our ability. And one of the first companies I started was 20, I think 2016, 2015. Didn't know anything and just used resources and figured it out and just kind of took that knowledge and kept growing. So when the opportunity presented itself, it's kind of all in. You know, I was like, I understand enough back end and with our friendship, like it's definitely probably our longest marriage. It is our longest marriage uh, with business partners. So, and that's definitely what's helped us stay together, uh, specifically just talking about business, but yeah, I love and care. And when we transition and um, one survival, I mean, a lot of guys have to reinvent themselves and it's nice to not have to, but be able to do it with people you want to be around spend time with and, and believe in the mission. Uh, and it kind of just naturally happened. I mean, organically, we didn't force anything. We stuck to our values what we wanted to do. And um, that kind of never quit and creating that culture and that environment, that team that believes in you and, and what you're doing was huge. Uh, but it, it was definitely, I think the never quit and always stay agile 
you know, I'm sure you get it too. People are like, oh, congratulations. It's amazing and success. You're like, would you think I was going to fail? COVID or not, like survival was like, we had to survive. It, it worked really well. So. Yeah, when you don't have a plan B, like you can really go all in on a, you know what I mean? Sure, like yeah. distractions, like there's no fallback. We did a product thing called Burn the Ships. It's like there is no retreat. There's no other option for us. This is the only thing we're doing. We're going the whole way. It's like, that's really been success. We're never looking backwards. We're not going back. It's not an option. No. Sure, yeah. What would you guys say now, like your biggest like purpose is in this whole project? Because like obviously transitioning into a different part of your career, typically what will help you like transition into something new with having a purpose. What would you guys say your biggest like driving like and not that it's an end goal that will ever happen, but that you are continuously working towards to grow towards like that purpose. Dude, for for me, mine mine changes almost weekly. You know what I mean? Like we'll get on a training kick and then it's like, you know, every thought I have is only about training. How am I gonna deliver this message or this in state to this group of people? And then we'll leave that and we'll come back and for me it'll be a lot of mental health and it's like i'm gonna beat the mental health wardrobe for the next 30 days as loud as i fucking can and then you get to see it like you get to you get to read the dms you get to see the messages and the outpour of it. and it's like well don't have to be a one-trick pony i don't just have to do this one singular thing like we can do a couple things at an ultra high level and really i think it's that you know we call them universals like it's it's one ideal that covers a wide variety of different topics and different people and different genres. A lot of that's like that be a pro. It's like physically be a pro, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. If you can connect them all to build your desired end state, like that's really what it's about. And a lot of dudes, I mean, you touched on a dude, they won't show being vulnerable. They just won't do it. Yeah. Like because of your background, they, they expect you to be this chest pounding fucking gorilla who never has any emotion and we've definitely been that dude for sure now we've made it to the other side for me personally i see the value in showing them the side they've never seen before i can be vulnerable like i'll show you right now and i think you catch more people with that and it motivates more people to be open and honest and selfishly it's for the group like whatever team you support whether that be your family a football team a hockey team a swat team whatever else that group of people you're around are truly the only thing that really matters social media is fucking fictitious it's not even real the people that live next door they don't matter the guys at the grocery store doesn't matter it's only the people you surround yourself with and if you kind of put them before yourself it's like a universal blanket of coverage man it just makes you all a better human and i think it saves you from a gnarly transition like me like if i would have had that approach sooner my transition wouldn't have been that bad. I just would have reinvented myself with the same foundation, the same values I've had this whole time. Like, I think a lot of that's what it is, is you know, setting them up for success on the transition. Because you're gonna live and die multiple times. You're gonna have to reinvent yourself a couple times during your, you know, hopefully 100 years on this planet mm -hmm. and to not have to hit a crazy downslope. Yeah, for sure. Would you say that there's almost like a, like, a dangerous time if you transition too early like obviously to do what you guys do it takes a certain level of shutting things off fucking that vulnerability and getting the job done and then that might take away from relationships and families and long term cause a lot of like repressed shit but there's a time where you got to do a job and if it's coming out at that point is that something where it's going to fucking slow you down get in your head cause you're going to misstep or something so it's almost like there's a time and place where you have to shut it all down and it might not be healthy, but it's to get the job done. And then you have to know when the transition time comes. I mean, I think with transitions, the individual has to be comfortable with it. Like you gotta be able to look yourself in the mirror and be okay uh, with what you see. No one else, in my opinion, can make that call for you, for you to be okay with when it is time to transition or hang it up. Um, that's a big one for me is that that transition. Yeah, I mean, you gotta look yourself in the mirror and be okay with it. With whatever you accomplished or you didn't. That's what's helped me. 
I think one of the things you hit on was kind of like alluding to the compartmentalization of external stress and factors that don't support your end state, like how much shit you have to be able to block out. I mean, divorce rates over a hundred percent for a reason, right? It's like that job at the ultimate level requires so much of you. It requires sacrifice. And the first thing you sacrifice is your family. It's like, it's so much easier for me to be gone on the road 320 days out of the year and block them out completely and be like a 25% husband and father. So I can focus on the mission, my progression, and getting everything ready. And then it's hard, man, because when you don't have that, it's like I've sacrificed 17 years to be the very best I can be at everything. And now I don't have a reason to do it anymore. There's no reason to wake up. I'm not in a group chat. No one's ever going to call me. I'm never going to lace it back up again. It's like, are you living with regret? It's like a lot of the times guys do, but in the moment, I don't know. I don't regret any of it. Not a bit. Like, yeah. I don't know. For me, I never would have felt like I, like I hit my potential if I wouldn't have sacrificed it. And I, I told my wife that. And you know, she's an angel, and I definitely don't deserve to have her. But I mean, I'd say it often. No one's gonna die today if I'm a 63% husband and 35% father. Nobody. If I slip up 1% at work and somebody dies, I'll never recover from it, man. I just won't. Like there's multiple people's lives on the line here, man. If I fuck up one ounce of this, everything we do is so dangerous. I mean, I don't say that to, I don't make it sound, it is, man. Like everything is dangerous. Like you could get killed doing that job multiple times a day, depending on what you're doing. It's like, it requires a lot of focus and a lot of attention to detail and a lot of passion. And it's hard to be able to split it. I, I probably shouldn't say this, I'll fucking say it anyway. I've never seen a dude that does 50 50 that I've ever respected the nine to five guys that punch in right before the first muster, the first dude to leave. I've never seen a dude who was anything worth a shit. I've never seen a dude that I ever wanted to emulate who did that mentality. Never. Everybody who I ever wanted to be like, or I ever got goosebumps when I walked into a room and I had like an emotional connection with, was in it a hundred percent. And you could see it, you could feel it. It's like, that's what it deserves at the highest level of any profession. And I don't know, for me, I, I respect that, but it is a gnarly transition. I think that's something hard for people to understand. If you want to be the best in the world at whatever you're doing, you have to sacrifice everything. Nothing else comes in the way of that. It's great if you have a support network that understands that, but if you want to be the best in the world, you have to sacrifice everything. Yeah, no, I mean, you say hard to understand, but I don't think anyone can sacrifice at the level you get to, because when you talk about life or death, like, it doesn't compare. Like, when I'm getting ready for Olympia, I know I can't be the 100% husband I need to to my girl, but she understands I'm going to check out a bit and do my thing, but I can come back after and, like, we can disconnect and connect a little bit, but it's not a hundred percent. No one's life's on the line. I'm just tired training and focusing on my goal. It's not, I don't think anyone can understand that kind of sacrifice like that. And like you said, there's a transition for me after prep where I'm like reconnecting my relationship. That's 12 weeks and then reset for the year. That's completely different. So I think, I mean, everything you guys are preaching and sharing and helping people transition is fucking incredible and i think there's so many lessons that like you guys are learning it from the hardest aspect and anyone trickle down can take that and apply it to the way they're applying to try to be the best in their position in their career and if you guys can do it fucking anyone can do it in my opinion so i think that's super cool you guys focus so much on that i appreciate that yeah, dude, me and the boys were talking about but, um, sorry me and the boys were talking about um being vulnerable and some of the stuff you put out dude I mean, I, I'm not saying you're on the fucking line. Like, that is some of the most impactful things you could possibly be doing with the platform you have and the amount of people you were able to reach to be able to show that. Because no one expects it. I mean, like, Mr. Fucking Olympia, no one ever would ever expect you to be vulnerable and to show chicks in your armor and just how hard it is being you and the pressure. We talked about a minute ago, like, the pressure to perform. Pressure's a privilege, man, right? Like, heavy is the crown. But for you to be able to connect with that many people and show them everybody's fighting through something, man. Everybody. Everybody's got trauma they're dealing with and everybody has stressors that get the best of them. And for you not to be able to express that, I think would be a disservice to everybody who follows you. Because I know personally, dude, I had tears in my eyes when I was reading some of them, dude. It just is. It radiates across the entire fucking world for you because so many people follow you. It's mm -hmm. like 
connect with that many people, that'll transcend everything you've ever done in the gym in person. I think that'll be a catalyst for your transition whenever you make it because you set the foundation for being a life coach, being a mentor, something that's not, it's not based around how you look. It's who you are as an individual. And people love that shit, man. They do. Like I had my wife read it and she's like, I can't believe he's that open. No shit. It's like, how awesome is that? So just for me to you, dude, really stoked you did that. Thank you. That's cool. You know, I appreciate it. And what helps me a lot is I think of like my, if I have a child, like, do I want them to think as they're coming to this world, if they want to be something successful, that they need to like numb their emotions and be perfect. And like, I can do it and have no pain. Or do I want them to see that I do struggle? I do have doubt. I do have fear. I do have all these feelings and I still persevere and push through because that's the reality of life. Like you said, everyone's going to have that shit. So who do I want to teach my child is what I want to teach anyone who's going to look up to me. I don't want to create that false expectation. That's going to lead to more stress and emotion and shit in people. So, I mean, you pass it on me. I pass that right back to you. you guys are, like I said, doing the hardest job and sharing the shit you do. It's you guys are like the top of that world of showing people that you can have it all. We all have emotions. We all have our shit. And we just got to work through it and stick together and build that community. But, uh, I mean, obviously part of this thing came together over our love for fitness and training and shit. So even talking about that, obviously fitness is a huge part of just staying alive and doing what you guys do overseas. Have you guys found that even like tying in mental health and shit that that's like fitness is something that helps out with that a lot, kind of an outlet there. And is that more, what would you say is more important? Is it like something is it equally mental health versus just what you need to do to perform or is it what lead one or the other? Or how do you guys see that? I mean, I grew up um, at a very young age competing and eventually getting to a very high competitive level. I remember them always saying like being mentally tough and how that's transitioned into mentally healthy and mentally tough. Uh, and it, I feel like that was kind of bred into me from early sports. And I think mental toughness and mental health is the number one thing. People look at, you can work out however much you want, be an expert at whatever you want, but if you're not mentally healthy, you'll never be 100%. That, that's become very eye-opening and it wasn't something that was ever talked about either. Uh, it was just a performance-based thing. But now like everything we've learned and looked through, whether it's overcoming injuries, adversity, resiliency, failure, any of it, it's like, how do you get back to that healthy men mental state is huge. And um, if you're not mentally healthy, you can't perform at a high-end level at anything. For sure. Yeah, dude, for me, um... We've been hurt a lot, dude. A lot. Yeah. I mean, you know the deal? I know you've been banged up a lot, too. And it's like coming back from that injury and rebuilding your physical confidence in whatever you're doing. It's a, it's a tough thing to do, man. Like, regardless of how bad that injury is, but some of them, it's like, you really get depressed. And the worst I ever was was when I wasn't able to do anything physically and connect it to. It's like, my goal now is to train 52 weeks a year. That's my only goal stay healthy enough because every day I walk in and I train, my mental health goes through the roof. I've never had a bad day in the gym, never, that hasn't spilled over into everything else. Every day I get to walk in here is automatically a positive day because I'm already in here. It's very hard for me to get into oppression when I'm able to work out and be able to move around and be with people and stand on my own two feet and move. It's like every day is a blessing now, but you know, when you were in, the physical connection was the only thing we focused on. Because you compartmentalize everything else. Stress, anxiety, depression. Nobody had it. I'll be honest, I was probably the first Navy SEAL in the history of the world to ever have depression. No one ever said it. It's like, and when you finally get out and you have the balls to say, like, yeah, me too. It's like, oh, where were you at 15 years ago, prick? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. said it. Because you got to get really good at compartmentalizing. And I understand it now. But to a certain point, like you love that group so much for you to sit there in isolation and watch everybody start to circle the drain and not to have the balls to be like, Hey, I'm going through it too. Like I have severe anxiety right now. Like I'm taking this pill and this pill and this pill just to get through the day. And like, Oh shit, me too. Yeah. Why don't you tell me that a decade ago, man? I thought I was going insane right now. I thought I'm the only one. 
Yeah. Yeah, man. Really just, yeah, the physical and the mental connection and blending the two together to be overall healthy. Like now that I've transitioned out with this dude, like that's what we pushed everybody else. Like mental health is super important. That physical connection, man, it's just as important. Without one, it's hard to have the other, in my opinion. For sure. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. They both play off each other. Even like my body being so directly like how it looks, if I'm mentally not feeling good, I start to look worse. And then if like I start to look better, I start to feel better. It's like it's just flow. You kind of have to constantly balance. So I, I totally agree with that. But um focusing a lot of mental health because I love that and I'm huge on that and I love that you guys focus on that too but I'm curious each of you guys of something you learned that's pressured pushed into like military mindset that's beneficial to life outside the military and then something that was instilled in you guys that was a negative in the coming into the civilian life mm. My, mine's kind of tied to um the competitions and playing sports and at a again at a very young age i figured out that i could push my body further than i thought it could go like overcoming that mental barrier and learning that your body and what you're capable of is way more than sometimes what you're mentally prepared for and that gave confidence and it i say taking leaps in faith and challenging myself to get where I wanted to go. It, w it gave me a lot of trust and faith in myself, uh, whatever it was, if it was something new, or I was trying to go to the next level and I say go pro or, or whatever it was, was that mental toughness and like just the working out, DJ touched on it. It's like in the morning, it's like you're pushing yourself mentally further than you thought you could go. Even if you feel it's a bad day or it's a good day, it's like you're, you're breaking barriers there and it kind of sets the pace for that day that lifestyle. I think the one negative thing from the entire history was um, I beat myself up over the littlest details. I hold on to them. And um, it's probably taken until now to like be able to let go of some of those for sure and, and not beat myself up so much. So that's definitely one negative. I think um, my number one, like my universal takeaway, is probably sacrificing for the group. Like being a direct representative of what you want the group to be, what's best going to support the end state. We do a bunch of talks like this, like, you know, if you were at an international job fair and you were to walk up on stage and like, you are a fireman or you are a Navy SEAL. What do you look like? What do you sound like? How do you perform? How do you connect with people? Like, are you a positive representative of that group? And do you make people want to backfill you and join that community because you're a direct representative of what they want to be? It's like the ownership piece over your individual process and how that connects the entire group. You know, asking yourself is what I'm doing right now, is it going to make my group better? Is it directly making them better? Is it hurting my group? Whether that be getting shit faced and getting a DUI, doing something stupid out in town, like, everything you're doing represents us all like that little ownership piece i think is a universal that i'll take with me the rest of my life and that's what i push out to a lot of people is the ownership over whatever your chosen profession is understanding you represent everyone who does that singular profession everyone but you've got a five-year-old trying to backfill you that just is looking for inspiration capitalize on it when you have the opportunity and then i'd say you know one negative that was a positive is how much you're willing to sacrifice for that group because it's a speeding train man it just is the military does not stop and at the end of the day as much as you love it as much as you are willing to sacrifice for it you're a magnet on a whiteboard and when you're gone they throw in the trash can and they put another one in your place and i'm not saying it's wrong but i'm saying for most paths outside of that that quality does not transition it just doesn't like you can't do that in really any other profession as far as you're willing to go for that one organization that one job field you know being in the military there's not a whole lot of other ones outside of police fire a couple things that have like some there's some heavy repercussions for error and you know i don't have any regrets over it but they do make you fall in love with that and i think that's the hardest part of the transition is you fall in love with that job and it becomes who you are so much 
because you take it on, you wear it all day. And then like for us, like I didn't want to retire, dude. I would have done 35 years. I never would have done this shit. Never. I didn't want to. It's like that fall from grace was so far because I was absolutely in love with it. That is all I have ever wanted to do my whole life. It's like, it's good, but you really do go all in. It's like all my chips are in on this one thing. And if it doesn't work out, you get your leg blown off when you're 22 years old. That's a hard thing to come back from, dude. That's probably the one negative, even though it's, oh God, it's kind of a positive. But Yeah, I mean, both your guys' negatives, it sounds like within a reason they are a positive, but then to do it at the level you guys were in the military, you pushed them to the point where it became a negative because they had to be so extreme. But I mean, it totally makes sense. So you can at least adapt a part of it instead of just being a 120% kill on that. Yeah. I've heard you say a few times that like, you didn't want to retire. Do you still have feelings now where you're like, fuck, I wish I was back there? Nope. <laughs> you know, there are moments, dude. There are moments when, you know, we'll be driving down the road and a C-17 will fly over some big plane. I'm like, oh, never going to get on it again. I'm just, it's never, never going to lace it up again. And then it's like when COVID happened. I couldn't imagine being in the military for that. Like the withdrawal with Afghanistan and a bunch of like stuff that's happened because now you get to see it from a different lens and like I'm so glad I'm not doing that, dude. Like you feel bad for him, but yeah, to Cole's point, no, like I'm I'm so happy that I was medically retired when I was. So happy. Yeah, I mean I, I wouldn't regret it and it's definitely exciting to see the the planes and helos, but everything we went through is what got us here today. So it's at love, love where we are today. So, but it's exciting to see it. Don't miss yeah. it. Appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, you guys also talk a lot about group, do it for the group. And I feel like such a, such a missing thing in our society is like community in general and it feels like that was like the backbone forever of like humans and now we're just all like very individual and i mean even myself moving i'm from canada and i moved down to the us and i was just trying to move to move and then nothing made me want to move until i found this community down here and we're building this company and i mean you guys see a fraction of our team right there and like you, you like you said at the beginning of the phone call like we got a great team and this is the only reason why i'm happy to have left my home country but uh, how much do you like think of is missing in that in the typical world? And how hard was it for you guys to build that community outside of the military? So you guys had each other, but then, then you have the kind of the gold star families. What was it difficult to build that community of kind of find that group to fight for? Or did you guys all like just bring that, bring it together somehow by just attracting it? I don't know, man. I thought it was pretty organic, dude. I mean, like in order to, around us anyway you have to be pretty damn similar anyway or you just you're gonna get eaten up <laughs> and spit out yeah we cherry pick everybody who's in here i mean we didn't hire anybody off you know indeed i mean we cherry picked every person who comes in here and our our interview process is very unrefined i mean we I mean, we are who we are man we don't put on college shirts for fucking anybody i mean just this is how we are and if you don't want to work with us don't come here right like i don't care yeah and, like I don't know. I think that overall culture, because of the people we have, I mean, we've got a bunch of military vets, got a bunch of gold star fan members, like they get the culture and they've already adopted into it. You just keep hiring like-minded people and pretty organic, dude. You think? Yeah, no, it was organic. Um, the, the biggest, one of the biggest things um, we believed in when we started was not doing anything we didn't believe in. And I think that kind of naturally attracted people uh, around us in community. And we weren't be some paid ad, um, show something that we didn't believe in. We were going to be honest about what it was that we were doing and talking about. Um, and we weren't chasing a number or anything. We were just, we were literally just trying to survive <laughs> and yeah. doing what we loved and being around the people that we wanted to be around. Um, but how about you? I mean, how many companies do you have? Um, we have four under this roof right now. 
but they're it's really all like a, it's all even the companies are a family you know yeah, yeah. but no we're, we're we're very similar to you guys and i mean we're like when you're like no bullshit person you are who you are people see that and they're either afraid to be near it or they are absolutely sucked into it and we're pretty our interview process is they're pretty much we already know you we've already seen what you can do we're like Calvin's just following me around the country everywhere. He'll, everywhere we go, me and Calvin work together forever, I imagine. And then the team just like, we just know. You meet someone, you connect and you know that they have a they have the track record. There's no bullshit. And if they don't fit in, they're gone in like a week, you know? So it's the same kind of shit. And it's it's been super cool, honestly, just to, to see exactly what you guys are talking about. We're living it here too. Just a mindset that becomes like a hive mindset. And you guys come in the office and people are excited to be here. It's not like just checking out at 5 p.m working on weekends because i mean these guys were excited to travel and do this with you guys because it's part of the job like we we have a pretty fucking cool thing and very grateful but it's the same thing and i think just not having the bullshit you attract real people and they also weed out really fucking quickly <laughs> we had a few people come in who didn't fit and they were gone in like two weeks and we we knew within a few days like how are we gonna get rid of this person they don't fit in here so it's cool i love that we've had a couple of those yeah. yeah, it's not all fun and games and success. I mean, the grinding and the hard work. What's uh, what's one thing that's really surprised you about owning companies, starting companies, kind of creating that culture around you? That's a good question. I think, I don't even know if it surprised me, but I mean, you just like, in the world of business, you just hear and see growing up of just like those money hungry entrepreneurs just chasing bills and cutting corners and doing all this shit and then every success we've had has just been the most organic like almost accidental thing it's like we like this we don't give a fuck if someone else is gonna buy it let's just do it we want to do our event like this we want the shirt to look like this we want this product we want like the labels I have a list and we put my list on the labels for the name of all our products we're just like who the fuck cares let's just do it it's funny I made our first label and I put a list on it and now it's like our number one selling product. So I think just constantly learning that the harder you try to like sell something, the worse it is. And the more you're just doing what you love, it just, it works and it doesn't stop working. So I don't know if that's a surprise so much as just something I maybe fought initially, but it's hard to deny it. I think we're definitely alike at that. And that's one big thing that we realized within the platforms that we have. And I know you have too, is like, impacting the next generations to come and you don't have to follow the industry norm and and following and doing what you love and staying organic and doing it how you envision it. and hopefully yeah. it'll on to the next generation Speak, speaking of things you love the wrist pieces i know you gather watch guys curious what are you guys wearing what's your favorite watch and you got a story behind it so today <laughs> I'm doing a Rolex Sea Dweller. Um, my wife, so it, it's customary when you make it through selection, um, going pro, you buy a Rolex, uh, you buy a Samarina, you buy a Sea Dweller, and you wear it. You know, the yeah. original, original brace. I mean, and to me that was just one of the coolest things. Like that showed the progression, you know, in the professional level when you show up at a barbecue and the dude look very different. They're bigger, they're older, they're saltier, they're fucking grisly. And then you see a really fancy timepiece on them, you're like, oh man, I really want one of those. So when I made it through, she got me one. So yeah, I've had this thing since 2010. I've seven or eight deployments on it. Like, I don't know how many skydives. I've, I've done everything. Just, yeah, keep running it, man. I have uh, the Panerai Rose Gold Carbotech. Um, we have goals with work and one of them we hit. And so we kind of do this rotation on picking watches, what it means to us. So we remember those, so it's definitely worth way more than what it costs. But yeah, I mean, looking down at the watches, it, it's a reminder of a lot of different things. Um, the good, the bad, the successful, staying a pro. So they all kind of individually mean different things. And I love rose gold and black too. So yeah, the watch on both. But you, you got a timepiece collection? I got a little bit. And I, I started moving down here. A lot of the guys here are in the watches. And 
one of my favorite ones. You guys all rock the sport band, obviously, so you can actually utilize it. But when I first moved down here, my two partners who brought me down here in the supplement company, Matt and Dom, they bought me uh, just like a sport band uh, offshore AP. And that's probably one of my favorite ones. Yes. Yeah, brother, that's a fucking nice piece. <laughs> yeah. Right, well, like, watch yourself now. Yeah, all right. Let me, let me, <laughs> dude. It's not as scuffed up as yours. No, probably had not seen as much shit, but it's a, it's a hell of a piece, and it was an amazing gift, and it was a cool, like, with my transition into moving into the U.S., starting a business, and doing all the stuff, so it does, it means a lot. It's really cool. Yeah, it's a beautiful piece. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what we have next in the cycle, but I don't know whose turn it is. Hopefully, it's mine. Yeah, we just step it, step it up, our goals up. Yeah, we have a couple milestones trying to hit. So yeah, we hit and we kind of go through the cycle. Been... Go, yeah. How do you manage your time every day? I'm, I'm kind of curious on schedules of like everything from working out and prep and what you're doing to businesses to family and what you enjoy outside of all that. I mean, it transitions a lot throughout the year. So like right now, I'm in the middle of prep, so my priority is just bodybuilding. I'll wake up at like seven, but I'm not like done my cardio stretch morning routine until like 10 a.m. And then I'll typically eat, chill, come in the office maybe for an hour or two. And then I just leave. We, I built a private gym now because I just had to <laughs> be alone. So I got a gym now pretty close by and I leave in the middle of the day. I go train when I have the most energy. Maybe I come back later in the day. Like I just trained before this, came back for the podcast and then go home and chill and just try and take it easy. And right now it's really trying to not have too much stuff on my mind. Cause if I'm like traveling, worrying about the businesses, having jumping on phone calls, doing all these things. And then I'm trying to get my mind into training mode. And then I get to the gym and I'm fucking exhausted. I haven't eaten enough. Like my body's just depleted. I got to do cardio and get a, like an intense workout in. My mind's not there. Then everything gets fucked. And then when that gets fucked, my mental health starts to go to shit. And then I start to become overstressed and then I'm just focusing on this narrow, like stress. So I realized this year, especially with all the businesses, I have to pull away from that and really prioritize bodybuilding if I still want to be the best in the world, because I can't balance all those things and do it all like that. So luckily I have a fucking amazing team. Like you guys see like something I really wish I could have been there, but I know these guys are going to do everything we need and we don't even need to ask them or see what's going on. They're going to go, they're going to do better than we could have imagined nail everything and the only thing that sucks is that i'm not there so that's how pretty much how i get through prep is i got partners in all my businesses too who, who get my back and they step up when i step away so it's how i get through all this and then typically throughout the year i'm traveling a fucking lot lately you know same as you guys i show up to business meetings and the guys are show up in polos and you know like embroidered raw and them and shit and i'm like fuck that i'm wearing my shorts socks up pulled up and a raw t-shirt next level t-shirt whatever the fuck i want i'm not dressing up for this so typically i'll wear i'll wear the nice ap and that's like all right i'm dressed up <laughs> but that's a lot it's a lot of travel for sure in, in the year and then and prep cut it out and focus on training but a lot of it is just making sure i can keep my energy and mind right to get in the gym and do the work i need to do how's prep going this year going good right now it was a horrible beginning if I'm being honest, I started off in a good spot and I was in, started off early, was in a good spot and then a bunch of kind of shit just started to come my way, some injuries, some health stuff and personal stuff and body just started to just, like I was saying, not respond. I was so stressed, wasn't sleeping. And my body, I think one week I lost like 14 pounds in seven days. Damn. And then from that point, four weeks, that was six weeks ago. From that point, I put on three pounds and stayed there because I've been feeling better and sleeping better. So my body's able to actually hold on to nutrients and train and feel better. But in that period, it was fucking rough. And that's when I was kind of going through realizing I was taking on too much onto my plate. So I had all this, not even necessarily stress, but just like divided attention and living this constant state of in a rush. And then when stuff started to come into my life that was stressful, I didn't have the bandwidth to take on all that. And then also prep for the Olympia. So I'd start picking things out, slowing things down, saying no to a lot more shit and just focus more on myself. And, you know, I have the most supportive girl ever who's got my back and she's a person who will like, I can lean on and talk to. And she's always like, you don't have to take on this much. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. Like step out and she's like, you want to be Mr. Olympia right now? You want to win this Olympia? 
or do you want to do this? I'm like, I want him in the Olympia. She's like, well, fucking focus on the Olympia. Take a nap. You don't need to be doing shit 24-7. I was like, yeah, all right, all right. So she's helped me a lot, and I'm super grateful. So luckily, we're in a good spot right now. Good, man. What does your training look like right now? We talk about sleeping. Like, How many hours do you sleep in a day, and what have you found to be optimal? Because I know for us, dude, average three hours a night, three and a half hours a night, and run that for yeah. great years? Yes. Like right now you do, or when you're... Oh, I mean, like right now, I mean, like we're on CPAPs and shit now. I mean, like we've obviously, we, we can dial it down now, but I mean, yeah, I'd say it's a one, two o'clock in the morning, wake up at 4.35 a.m. every day, rain or shine. <laughs> really? Yeah, dude. And it just, it really takes a toll physically. And now, now that you know, you realize what you're doing, I mean, yeah. you were recovery is everything like are you napping during the day or are you getting what's your sleep protocol look like yeah i mean i obsess over sleep and when i don't get my sleep everything goes downhill like everything and like you said recovery as a bodybuilder is pretty much everything maximizing recovery to maximize output starts with recovery but uh i sleep like nine and a half ten hours a night and i get up a lot but i go to bed at like i'll be in my bed at like 9 30 and then I'll wake up at like 7.38. So it's, and if, if I don't do that, if I'm up late, I try and take a nap, but if I get that, I don't need a nap, but sleep is huge for me and my body needs it. So I could not imagine three to four hours a night. <laughs> it's rough for sure. When you first started bodybuilding, um, what was it like and what, I say, gave you the confidence or courage to go pro and like really, I won't say you weren't diving 100% into it, but what really made you dive 100% like, I'm going to do this? I mean, I think it was just proving myself over and over again that I was getting better and better and just seeing the effort and work I put into it kind of coming back and fine tuning all those details and just seeing the bits of control I had and getting better at those. And it slowly built. But when I started bodybuilding, I didn't even really consider going pro or going to the Olympia, I was just like, I want to win a show. I want to get jacked and shredded. And then I want to win a show. And then I won that show and I was like, I want to win provincials. And then I want to win nationals and I want to go pro. And it just kept kind of like getting to the next level. And then when I was 21, I think, or 22, I, I qualified to go to the Olympia and I was still in college. And I was like, fuck this. I'm going to the Olympia. I'm going to just go all in on this. And this is like, this is my life now. No more partying in the offseason. No more staying up late. No more eating shitty food. Everything is like dialed to be the best bodybuilder in the world right now. And then two years later, I won my first Olympia. And been four years since then, and we're going on number five now. So it took just slowly kind of proving that confidence in myself and then kind of taking it day by day. But it's been a hell of a journey. Yeah, dude. That's awesome. I got a question. It's not off topic, but sort of what is your cheat meal? After the contest, <laughs> I'm I'm so fucking boring. I have like a healthy mug cake that my fiance makes. Cause she's super like holistic, and if I eat like shit, I feel like shit after the show. So sometimes we get like these. Uh, do you guys know Cool Whip? Do you have that in America? No. Yeah. It's like a fake version of Cool Whip that she gets. It's like coconut whip, so it's dairy free. And then we have crispy minis, the caramel crispy minis and dip it in that and like that's my extent of that night and then we go to a nice restaurant the next day because if i eat like shit the night of the olympia i wake up like headache bloated feeling like shit still i'm so depleted but pretty boring honestly in my off season though i just i'm a basic i like sweet potato fries and a burger so keep it simple you talk a lot about mental health and you know the mindset the preparation becoming a champion all that do you have a do you have a mental health or a mental performance coach or what is your daily mantra to get yourself in the zone when you're not feeling it? Like I've got some go-to shit that I do to try to realign my focus and try to compartmentalize some of the external factors that plague everybody. Do you have mm -hmm. any, you found work best for you? Um, I mean, I have a therapist and I, I thought about getting like a mental like performance coach. And then the more I really started to like, dive deeper into like myself and more introspection i realized that i don't need someone to teach me how to perform i need me someone to teach me how to like 
release and like understand myself better and just like typical therapy. I found a really good therapist who helps me and she challenges me a lot. She's pretty fucking aggressive. She's not just someone who listens to me. Like I say some bullshit. She like argue, will argue on the phone call sometimes because she knows she's right. And I'm like just being stubborn. But she's helped me a lot. But I mean, honestly, typically that's something that helps me is just like I was talking about before when I get in that like narrow site, like it's physically like a narrow site of just stress focusing on this catching myself and just being able to like realize how many things I'm grateful for and just kind of pulling that out there and just like literally looking around me physically and just being able to like take in more rather than just the stress, slow myself down and like count the things I'm grateful for. Cause I mean, like literally this country where it's pretty fucking amazing and just being able to like live in that, enjoy that and then focus on the work I got to do. Naturally, I've been pretty good at compartmentalizing my whole life. I can just not think about it and it goes away for a while. So honestly, what's harder for me is bringing it back up to not hold it all in. So I typically can compartmentalize well, but really focusing on like just how beautiful life is and being grateful for like this journey I'm on. Like I have the opportunity to try and be the best in the world at something. And everyone's like coming to try and beat me and it's pressure, which is a privilege, like you guys said. That's just like how many people have that opportunity? to have like an entire like industry chasing after them to try and beat them. Like that's fucking cool. And I'm only going to get this for a short period of time. So I'm just enjoying it right now. Well said, dude. I mean, me and Cole talking about it, like, you know, pressure is a privilege in, I mean, I guess we get it on a micro scale, but you know, we just talking about how hard it is to be you. Uh, to go to a grocery store and it gets stopped and to be pumping gas and gets in just, you have to be on, you have to be the guy that everybody expects you to be 24, 365, man. Like you can't have an off day and just that pressure. I know it fucking weighs on you, dude. It has to, but at a, at a certain point, like that lets you know that you made it. Like we've got a Kobe sign in there. Like having haters is good, dude. Let you know, you made it. like they don't hate the average ones. They hate the great ones. It's like, that's good, man. Like it, it's good to have that much external pressure, but it's gotta be exhausting, dude just to, to be one of the most recognizable fucking dudes on earth. <laughs> it, I mean, like, it's not like you're a packet of peanuts, like you're a massive dude. So it's like, they see you coming from literally a mile away. Like, yeah, you're not hiding from anybody. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I can guarantee you though, it's less pressure than what you guys have done in your life. Like you said, you slip up once and people's lives are missing. So I just, I got people who look up to me, but it's, it's, it's much different. So I'm sure you guys understand it better than anyone. Did you think it was going to go off like that? Like when you first started bodybuilding, did you think the brands were going to come and all that, or did you just want to win the Olympia and that was it? Did you think all I the? Just want, I just wanted to be fucking two hundred and fifty pounds when I started. I didn't even think anything was coming. Honestly, I had none of this in my field of view. I just kept wanting to get better, and it all just kept coming. And I was like, "Fuck, you know, it's 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 been a hell of a it's been a hell of a journey." And I'm just trying to soak it all in right now. How many weeks out of you right now? Five? Um, four and a half. Yeah. yeah get there. What are you most excited about for, for the show? I feel like every year, the past four years that I've won, something at the end of my prep has kind of like really challenged me and really tested me and forced me to like kind of pull myself out of it and come back to this like moment of like being like appreciative of my journey. And I feel like this year that happened to me at the 12 week out mark and I've had this much time to get ready. So I think I'm just like so prepared this year to like whatever the fuck comes, I'm ready for it. And I just feel a little bit more like alive and like ready. Whereas sometimes I'm almost waiting for something to happen. Now I'm just like, fuck it. This is it. This year is going to be the one that I enjoy. Like, and then I just ride through it and I just, every day just kind of feels like I'm able to enjoy it a little bit more because of that. So that alone is what I'm kind of taking in right now. Did you have one Olympia that, I mean, gearing up for number five, is there one that stands out as being definitely the hardest one out of all of them? It's hard to say. Every year's had some shit going on. 2021 was mentally probably one of the toughest ones I got through. 
some shit that happened to my family that I still can't really talk about, but it was just like, it was just a shit storm. And again, my mental health affects my body a lot. Started to, my body started to fall apart after that. And then my mental health started to fall out further because my body was falling further and it was just a trickle effect. So probably 2021. And I mean, again, like I said, those are the things now where I feel so prepared because I went through that shit and I can look back and be like, that sucked then, but like, I feel so prepared now. It was so worth it. Cause I know I can take on whatever challenges come. I mean, I'm sure you guys, like I said, you guys took on COVID being able to pivot. You guys know that feeling. You got through some shit, but it, it makes you confident that you know you can get through more shit. Who would you say are some of your most influential mentors or motivators or who you looked up to? Um, probably my dad. <laughs> Just a simple ass dude. And he the kind of guy who like didn't complain, always got the always got shit done. Whatever the family needed, he was there for us. He was the rock. He was like the stable like guy who was always there. So I just grew up like really respecting the way he held our family together. And it's like, I have a lot of ambition or dreams of being a, like a father myself. And that's like a huge goal of mine. And so I'm looking forward to trying to make a better version of myself, hopefully. And I feel like he's a huge reason for that. And a huge reason I am who I am. And the impact he had on me makes me like very grateful. So it was huge. How about you guys? So I grew up swimming and competitively swimming. Um, so definitely always looked up to, you know, the US Olympian swimmers uh, on some of that side. There were a few seals, cause I, I mean, we grew up around here that I definitely looked up to, um, but I don't know, like there's such a, I had such a wider array of people in different backgrounds with different things that have always kind of take me under their wing and show me a lot of stuff and push my, push me to get outside of my box and comfort zone. And I mean, a number of things, whether it was physically, mentally, different situations. I mean, I'm sure you know how public speaking is. It's fucking scary as shit. Like okay. how to come at and like you know create that craft. I have a, I say an on-screen coach. He's like your body posture, like the way you're breathing, and I mean, being able and comfortable to like start something new and learn. Um, I'll say there's there's been a couple for sure um yeah i don't have anyone specific to name i mean i, I think initially my dad I know, he was a seal i grew up you know being in and around that my whole life he had me pretty young so when he graduated buzz my mom was nine months pregnant with me so I mean, two weeks after I was born, I mean, he checked in a SEAL Team 1. So, I mean, we did the whole career together. I mean, I looked up to him a lot. And then when we got in the teams, there's certain people that you see. And then when you get to see them at work, you get to see them do the deed. It's at such an ultra high level that you didn't know existed previously. Right? Like, the standard is the standard until someone exceeds it. And then that becomes the new standard. And it was like, People just kept doing that over and over. And I mean, we tell some of the boys the other day, like I've had some of the most philosophical Jordan Peterson-esque conversations around a table full of the most savage dudes on planet Earth. I mean, the shit they are talking about would break the internet. No one has ever had that conversation, I promise you. And you're sitting there and you try not to get starstruck, but like this is my whole life wrapped up into this room and everything that just came out of your mouth, like, if it wasn't for my ego, I'd cry at this table right now. Like I have never felt more connected to a group of grown men than I do in this room right now. Oh my God. And it's like, yeah, I mean, like you're just surrounded by your heroes. It's like, holy shit, dude. And yeah. I don't, it seemed like just every, every time we'd, we'd get on a new team or a new deployment or something else, like another pioneer, another figurehead would come in. And it's like, now you get to see it at another ultra high level, just, different personality traits, different training methodologies, just different approaches to life in general. It's like, if I could just take you seven people and mold you in, download whatever you have and inject it in everybody else, like I could make the super force. I mean, you just could. And you realize at the very end of it, the only thing that makes them better than everybody else on earth is their mindset. They all have the exact same one. They are willing to go farther than everybody else in the room. 
and when the entire collective has that same thing, it just transcends everything else on earth. It's like, that's it. Like, that's how you become the very best on earth is your mindset more than anything else. Yeah, I mean, for mine, like, it's kind of evolved over the years, but yeah, it kind of started with the old man and then different, different dudes kind of took a spot. Yeah, just yeah. at all high level. I would love to hear some of those conversations. It's so true. Like a leader with that mindset and then the trickle down effect that can have, it just, it can, it changes the absolutely everything. It's super cool. But um, I feel like we can wrap this up. So I could, I would love to be down there talking to you guys. I feel like that's a lot of shit I could be asking you guys and keep going. So I will hold my word if you guys will have me. I would love to come back up there and do some cool shit. But uh, is there anything you guys want to say, wrap this up, anything we missed or anything you want to add? I mean, one, really appreciate the opportunity, man, to kind of collaborate with you guys and be able to launch this in a soft goods line. You know, selfishly, I'm a beneficiary of the foundation, the Navy SEAL Danny Dietz. Um, my wife's a gold star wife. She was married to Danny when he got killed in 2005. So it's near and dear to both of our hearts. We've both been beneficiaries of the foundation and the people it supports, I mean, you know, the deal, man, 501c threes are very niche and you have to fall into a very specific column. And if you don't, a lot of them can't help you. And that's really where that foundation comes in. It really bridges the gap. Police, fire, all the first responders and active duty military and retirees that you know, they've been injured in the line of duty and they can't go to work. They're in the middle of a transition in that job they had. They can't do it physically because they're broken. So we're able to step in with some grants and really help them out, help out the Gold Star family. So you know, for you guys to reach out and offer this opportunity for us, man, it means the world to, to us and you know, everybody here on this team. So super humbled, very honored, and looking forward to more in the future, man. If we can do anything, anything, don't call William, really. Yeah, I appreciate it. I want to say humbled and appreciate it. Um, we know how much care and how, how close and tight we hold our brand and to give us the opportunity again to collaborate with, with you guys at such a high level. Um, we don't need to hear it, but I mean, your, your team's a pro, the best in the world. And um, what this collaboration and, and the money it'll raise and the families that'll affect, we really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm sure yeah, I can promise you were equally as humbled and honored and we were discussing wanting to start giving back more and doing stuff and when we were like saw you guys and we were talking about some military giving back and the Danny Deets and everything it, it was like everybody was like fuck yes we're done that's it that's what we're starting with so I can promise you everyone here is super excited and hopefully we can keep doing more shit in the future because I know this is going to crush it and hopefully help a lot of people too no we'll for sure yeah. Good luck in the rest four and a half weeks. Really looking forward to congratulating you here. Yeah, we'll be Thank down you. at the beginning of December. Hopefully, uh, yeah. maybe meet up in person. Absolutely, yeah. i am come back like December 5th, but if you're still around or something, I would love to. It would be awesome. Yeah, yeah for sure. Oh, good luck. We know you'll kill it. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. And thank you guys for coming on the podcast and a lot of cool shit coming up between the two of us. So we'll be talking more about that. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and see you guys later. Thanks, Thanks. for having us. Okay, hey, <clears throat> real talk. <laughs> real talk. So, first Olympia, the one you won, did you know you were going to win it? No. What, what was the first thing that went through your mind when they called your name? Honestly, a lot of relief. Yeah, I uh, in 2018 was the year I starting prep. I thought I was gonna win, and I actually ended up in the hospital that year for a week. I had an autoimmune disease. I was fucking sick. I thought I was gonna be like bedridden for like a lot of my life, and I was like everything done. And I had this like that was my like closest face was like not so much death, but just like how fragile life is for myself. And then after that, I was living like afraid, like fearing it autoimmune, it can come back, stress causes it. And then I kind of got the okay to get back into training and doing everything. And I'm like, am I going to kill myself doing this? But I didn't really know what else to do. And I felt like I was young, just going to try it. So I just did it. And then the next year was 2019 and I was so scared. My health wasn't, still wasn't great. And I was just like, I'm going to get sick again. I'm going to fuck my shit up. I'm going to just, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? 
and then the last few weeks started to come together, started to feel a little bit better, but it was just so much stress. And then somehow I still won and got through it. And I just remember being like, oh, fuck, like shoulders just dropped and just like relief. And then I was going to quit. <laughs> I was like, I'm done. Fuck this. And then that's the year that forced me to start focusing on my mental health. And like, instead of suppressing all that fear of my health, like letting it out, taking control of my health a lot more, focusing a lot more on my shit. And then 2020 was probably my best Olympia ever, best I, one of the best I looked, one of the months I enjoyed the most. And it was pretty cool to see just the transition of my body, my health, and my mind over a year. So, yeah, it was cool. Yeah, I mean, and as a fan, just watching on social media, kind of watching your progression, somebody did a really cool lineup. I don't know if it was 2018 to present day to watch it. Dude. Like, no homo, man. It's a fucking masterpiece, dude. Like, in, like we talk about it. There is not a goddamn thing easy about that, dude. That has been a struggle day in and day out. And really, man, like, to see it at that level, I mean, anything at that level, you fucking world's best, dude. Like you said, like, everybody's chasing you, and that's got to be such a fucking awesome feeling, dude. Well-deserved, man. Good for you. Uh, I appreciate it. Got to light the fire in my ass right now. <laughs> yes, Get it. Hey man, like real talk. If we can do anything, just call. We're two and a half hour flight away, man. So you wanna come up after everything's done? You can come up here as long as you want. You want us to come down there, we'll do that. Heard you got a couple of so we'll come down and do some training. Love to. Yeah, and same with me, getting anything. Hit me up. I appreciate it. No man. Really appreciate the crew coming out here, dude. They're fucking studs, man. <laughs> they are, yeah. Yeah, dude, it's been awesome having them out here. They put on their yeah. own knowledge transfer clinic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dude, it's cool. it, it gives us, like, I mean, it, I think it added more fuel to the fire for us and our team to see these guys. Yeah, it's really cool to see. Yeah, I love it. All right, man, go eat something. <laughs> go on and recover. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pass out. I got to go get some food. <laughs> yeah, man. Thank you. Right. We'll talk soon. Yeah, have a good day. Thank you.